morning everyone so as uh, ma'am has told uh, we uh, routinely encounter patients having constipation almost 50% of the patients will be having constipation who present to palliative care uh, constipation is uh, under recognized under reported and under treated symptom so so this is my brief outline uh, uh, the intestinal physiology uh, impact of constipation diagnostic criteria prevalence pathophysiology and opioid induced constipation and management of constipation so a little bit about uh, gut physiology uh, there are two plexus gut is mainly uh, controlled by enteric nervous system and in the gut wall in the intestinal wall there are mitric plexus and mesenteric plexus mitric plexus is control the motility of the gut while mesenteric plexus is associated with the absorption of fluids secretion and local motility so intestine uh, the peristalsis how does the peristalsis take place once the food bolus comes uh, this is from oral to anal when there are few uh, lots of uh, neurotransmitters and hormones are involved so the in uh, mucosa submucosa circulatory muscle and mitric plexus and longitudinal muscles the circular muscles got contracted and these leads to forward uh, propulsion and at the same time with the receptors they there will be relaxation of uh, in the forward movement with the help of uh, vip that is vasoactive intestinal peptides this ascending excitatory pathway will leads to contraction while the descending inhibitory motor neurons will leads to relaxation so there will be continuous uh, propulsion and relaxation propulsion and relaxation that's how the uh, food got uh, assimilated digested and reached to the uh, rectum and then defecation happens so once the food bolus uh, the digested food comes into the rectum there will be distension of rectum and this distension leads to st stretching of uh, st stretch receptors stimulation of stretch receptors which ultimately leads to uh, stimulation of mitric plexus in the sigmoid colon and rectum and this will uh, leads to stimulation of parasympathetic motor neurons in the sacral spinal cord and ultimately it goes into stimulation of somatic motor neurons now from there two things happens uh, one is that uh, the anorectal canal and second is uh, there is contraction of external anal sphincter if the patient or the person is having a voluntary relaxation means they want to pass then there will be voluntary relaxation of this external anal sphincter and the defecation occurs and uh, the bowel function is mainly a uh, balance between intestinal fluid handling and motility so so how much fluid we uh, like uh, we take almost 1.8 to 2 liters of uh, oral fluid then there will be salivary secretions of 1.6 liters 1.6 liters of uh, gastric and 2 liters of bile and pancreatic secretions so total of around 7 uh, and intestinal also secretes 2 liters so ultimately the jejunum and duodenum that small intestine will have almost 9 liters of fluid out of which 70 uh, 7 to 7.5 liters will get absorbed in the small intestine and 1.5 to 2 liters will go in the large bowel that is colon and rectum here this uh, will get absorbed so uh, ultimately only 150 to 200 ml of fluid get uh, passed in the feces so there is a close balance between absorption and secretion even 100 ml of extra fluid may leads to diarrhea while less than 100 ml may leads to constipation so there is a strict balance between absorption and secretion and this absorption and secretion usually take place with the help of villus and crypto, uh, cryptic cells the villus cells in the intestine will leads to secretion while cryptic cells leads to absorption and these are moderated by various neurotransmitters and hormones <coughs> so this is how the fluids and the motility will happen so what is the impact of constipation the impact of constipation is that the patient will be quite distressed 
and even at times they stop taking analgesics which is basically we give opioids so they even stop taking opioids and patient will suffer i mean they prefer to suffer in pain rather than be in constipation and for hospitalized they will require more of nursing care and more hospitalization so it is quite a burden to the uh, health care so in this systematic review they found that uh, the impact of constipation was comparable to chronic disease like diabetes rheumatoid or ischemic heart disease and management of constipation does improve quality of life so what are the diagnostic criteria they this uh, uh, chronic constipation is diagnosed by rom 3 criteria in rom they they have a consensus based on uh, this and uh, it was initially diagnosed uh, considered for uh, inflammatory bowel syndromes then uh, the chronic constipation also included uh, which is a common feature in ibs and uh, they found that uh, any two of these six if they are present for at least 12 weeks in preceding 12 months like straining during bowel movement lumpy or hard stool sensation of incomplete evacuation sensation of anorectal blockage or obstruction manual evacuation or less than 3 bowels per movement if any of the two are present then we say that patient is constipated chronically constipated prevalence is that uh, almost 20 to 65% of the cancer patients will be having constipation while uh, aids and heart disease and copd will have around 35 to 40% constipation while chronic renal disease will have up to 70% prevalence of constipation so almost 50% of the patients presenting to palliative care will cite constipation as a problem so it can be primary or it can be secondary primary is basically functional then again there is a functional uh, bowel disorders classification based on that like there may be uh, irritable bowel syndrome functional constipation functional diarrhea functional abdominal bloating or distension unspecified functional bowel disorders and opioid induced constipation so the secondary causes include the patient may be having uh, dehydration or inadequate fluid intake low fiber diet or immobility then there may be poor bowel habits that uh, they don't uh, they ignore the urge to defecate then there may be malignancy which may cause intraluminal or extraluminal compression there may be obstruction due to malignancy especially colon cancer then various nervous uh, pathways are involved so there may be neurological insult to the peripheral or the central neurologic system that is autonomic neuropathy or diabetes then multiple sclerosis spinal cord injury then uh, endocrine patient may be having hypothyroidism hyperthyroidism hyperparathyroidism diabetes few chromocytoma and pregnancy then chronic kidney disease electrolyte abnormalities which commonly observed in palliative patients like hypercalcemia hypokalemia hypomagnesemia then uh, there may be these are a little uh, rare causes we encounter in palliative care but uh, depression anorexia dementia they are commonly seen in palliative patients so these are further potentiate uh, the patient with constipation some of the drugs which are used in palliative care like vinca alkaloids as a chemotherapeutic agents will have up to 35% uh, incidence of constipation then antidepressants like alprazolam oral iron preparation given for anemia uh, prevention like uh, have 20% incidence then antihypertensive and cardiovascular drugs then commonly used uh, nsaids like diclofenac sodium is also had uh, 3 to 9% of incidence then atropine uh, and uh, ondansetron also has been found to cause up to 11% uh, constipation and omeprazole and all those antacids they are commonly uh linked with constipation so how do we assess constipation so before uh, we encounter a patient we should ask the patient when he has passed uh, last stool and how many movements he frequent uh, have like uh, in a week then consistency of stool whether it is hard or soft then any recent change in bowel patterns whether they have asked to defecate or not whether they have a uh, sensation of evacuation which can be complete or incomplete evacuation sensation then fecal incontinence whether present or not evidence of blood or mucus on defecation current or previous laxative use and need for distal manipulation to assist or manage evacuation so these uh, 
of this, these symptoms will definitely help us in diagnosing uh, the cause. Constipation as such is a symptom, it is not a disease. So we have to see for the underlying cause. Most of the time there may be some cause. So after history, we need to examine, uh, first we need to examine abdomen examination. Uh, we should see for uh, any distension abdomen, there is made by abdominal mass due to, there may be colon cancer. So there may be ascites, there may be uh, other lesions. Then lay, there may be liver enlargement, which might be tender. Then bowel sounds we need to hurt. Then uh, bowel sound will definitely help whether the patient is having obstruction or not. Or may sometimes they may be absent in, uh, they will definitely absent in paralytic ileus. Then we should examine uh, perineal to, to see for skin tags, fissure, prolapse, anal warts, or ulceration. Then digital rectal examination should be done in patients who are clinically constipated, like uh, having inner hemorrhoids, sphincter tone should be checked, whether it is uh, present or not. So the, like in patients who had uh, neurological issues, they may be having poor tone then any tenderness, obstruction or stenosis, impacted feces sometimes we encounter and there may be complete absence of stool in the uh, rectum then tumor mass or blood on finger. So do we need to investigate? Investigations are rarely needed but if the history is suggestive of uh, obstruction then we should uh, get an abdominal x-ray which will reveal uh, multiple gut fluid levels then serum calcium level, corrected serum calcium level should be checked, especially in patients who are having uh, hyperparathyroidism or if there is any calcium abnormalities, means patient may be having hypercalcemia. So that will definitely help us in knowing uh, the cause. Then thyroid function test will similarly if the patient is having hypoparathyroid, hypothyroidism. So how do we measure uh, the constipation? Various scales are being used like visual analog scale, the constipating, uh, constipation scoring system, assessment scale. Bowel function index is the common, most common and validated tool to assess chronic constipation. So bowel function index is a, uh, in this, we, uh, there are three domains like uh, ease of defecation during last week, feeling of incomplete evacuation and personal judgment of the patient uh, of constipation during last week. So each uh, domain will be given a score of 0 to 100, where 0 will be uh, easy and 100 will be uh, severe difficulty. So each score will be getting a, a score of uh, out of 100. So we add all three and divide by three. So we will get a score out of 100. So if the score is, uh, if it is more than 30, then we can say it is uh, it is suggestive of opioid induced constipation. We will come to opioid induced constipation later. And uh, reduction in 12 score represents significant change. Then we can give a patient uh, that uh, Bristol stool chart. Bristol stool chart will definitely help. Uh, this will help in knowing the shape and consistency. Shape of the stool, uh, like if the patient, is, uh, that shape of the stool, uh, stool will be able to identify or we can take as a surrogate marker of colonic uh, transit time. Like if the patient is having hard lump or lump and sauces like, then it is constipation. If it is sauces uh, shaped with crack on surface or like a smooth soft sauces or snake like, then it can be considered normal. While uh, soft blob with clear cut edges indicates lack uh, of fiber in the diet and uh, this Type 6 and 7 indicates diarrhea. So coming to uh, opioid induced constipation, in this study they found that uh, the incidence of uh, opioid induced constipation was around uh, 25 to 90%. So why does the, how does the patient will have constipation? Uh, the, since opioids act on new opioid receptors and these opioid receptors are uh, distributed in whole of the GIT, starting from uh, esophagus to the inner part. And uh, they have different actions on different uh, gut parts. Like in esophagus, they cause dysmo uh, dysphagia and heartburn. Uh, in uh, stomach, these uh, opioids uh, causes early stiting, 
heart burn, nausea, vomiting, and gastroparesis. And in the small bowel, uh, they cause uh, dysmotility, fluid balance disturbance, and uh, small uh, intestinal bacterial overgrowth. While in the gut, uh, in the gallbladder, they may cause uh, constriction or spasm of sphincter of odi. So there will be less of uh, biliary secretions and pancreatic secretions and uh, poor digestion of uh, food and there may be abdominal pain while in the colon they will decrease uh, colon uh, transit time and uh, here in the external sphincter they causes uh, incomplete relaxation that will leads to a straining and uh, uh, incomplete evacuation or feeling of uh, incomplete evacuation so the <clears throat> The generalized cause uh, decreased bowel tone and contractility leading to increased transit time, increased contraction of circular muscles. So there will be non-propulsive uh, contraction in fluid absorption, while uh, there will be decreased contraction of longitudinal muscles. So that will lead to decreased propulsive or forward movement. So that will lead to harder and drier stool. And uh, some in, uh, chloride channels are also involved in uh, small intestine that causes fluid secretion in the gut. So it inactivates those chloride channels. So there will be decreased gut secretion and absorption of water together with less gastric and pancreatic biliary secretions. And uh, as I told, sphincter tone will be uh, increased. That is leading to rectal distension. So it is so common. The opioid induced constipation is so common, but still we are not able to diagnose. There are certain barriers like uh, there is uh, lack of awareness among clinicians about OIC that it happens and even if the clinicians are aware they may not ask questions about constipation to the patient patient might feel ashamed to disclose their symptom to the clinician they will have uh, uh, hesitation in disclosing this information that they are constipated then there may be absence of uh, universal diagnostic criteria for OIC and uh, the effort to screen patient based on wrong three criteria may not cover the whole spectrum of OIC that might present with abdominal pain. In fact, o o o OIC, that is opioid induced constipation has been changed to opioid induced bowel dysfunction, which involves uh, everything Ex uh, other than constipation. There may be dysmotility and abdominal pain. All those symptoms are included into OIBD. So the wrong criteria was, uh, I mean, opioid induced constipation was uh, in included in uh, wrong four criteria. And uh, in this, patient should be have must have at least two of the following, and this should be present for at least twenty five percent of the defecation. Means one fourth time, patient will be having straining, straining, lumpy hard stool, sensation of incomplete evacuation, anorectal bulge, or uh, blockade, and then manual manual to facilitate defecation. This is quite similar to what we uh, discussed in wrong three criteria, but. There will be at least, it should be there at least for 25% of the defecation. These four should be there. And uh, loose tools are rarely present without use of laxatives. And there are insufficient criteria for irritable bowel syndrome. So does it mean that uh, if we give more of it, it will cause more constipation? Uh, they have done a study <coughs> in which they found, they evaluated uh, opioid induced constipation in patients who are receiving opioids and they took a 24 hour oral uh, morphine equivalent and found and uh, they uh, reported constipation, self reported constipation and they found that there is weak association or uh, lack of association between oral morphine equivalent and constipation. So if, even if we decrease the uh, opioid, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that patient will not be having constipation. So coming to management, <clears throat> so the non-pharmacological management, as we told, it's uh, more of a symptom, it's a subjective symptom like pain, and it requires uh, uh, underlying uh, lifestyle modifications and uh, treatment of the correctables. So in lifestyle modification, we can ask the patient to eat more fiber, like more beans, whole grains, uh, bran, cereals, and fresh fruits and vegetables, which has more fiber and uh, foods with the low fiber like cheese meat sweet and processed food should be limited in quantity then patient should drink more liquids water and liquids and they should be told to drink at least eight to ten glass of water uh, every day but 
in palliative care it is hard, uh, hardly feasible a patient are not able to uh, take so much of liquid but liquid helps in keeping the stool soft patient should be advised to be more physically active they should be involved in uh, exercise even uh, from uh, lying on bed to sitting on chair will definitely increase the bowel movement it has been seen a patient should have enough time to have a bowel movement if they are in hurry then they may ignore the urge to for bowel movement which can lead to constipation then avoidance of chocolate and spicy food the spicy food at times will cause uh, gastric stimulation and lead to bowel upset so they should be better avoided in such patients stress is a common cause for uh, functional constipation patient will have those so all these activities like yoga meditation time management music therapy spa and they should be advised so that patient will not have uh, stress and uh, this will help then sitting posture uh, during defecation so this is a normal western commode in which the patient will sit and we can advise the patient to use a stool so that uh, his uh, legs can be i mean knee can go up and the we can see here in puborectalis muscle this is puborectalis muscle which chokes the rectum to maintain continence but if the patient is in squatting position with the help of a stool then the puborectalis muscle relaxes and strengthens the pathway so the indian commode are better suited for defecation for early defecation so this is the angle which got increased while the patient is in squatting position so this this is sphincter yes <clears throat> so coming to pharmacological management so as uh, this article was published last year in oh, supportive care in cancer uh, having opaid uh, induced bowel dysfunction these are suggestion from multidisciplinary expert board in uh, italian society and they evaluated whether uh, amora that is peripherally acting mu opaid receptor antagonist whether it should be used and how much they should be used various laxatives uh, which laxatives should be used and whether we should go for uh, anema or rec digital uh, rectal uh, evacuations so they have given some uh, uh, suggestions and uh, this is from uh, esmo guideline which was published uh, in 2018 so if we encounter a patient who complains of constipation or say that it is defecation is less than 3 uh, times in a week then we need to assess the patient to confirm constipation with all physical uh, with history and physical examination and we need to exclude malignant bowel obstruction so once we have found the cause then if it is correctable we should go for the treatment of the cause if it is not correctable if it is not correctable then they have given uh, three guidelines the first line treatment will be oral laxative which is a combination of stool softener that is polyethylene glycol and electrolytes or and a stimulant which can be sena or sodium picosulfate according to patient's need if there is improvement then continue with the regime if there is no improvement then second line is rectal suppository and anema and uh, if the patient is taking opiate and we can say that it is due to opiate induced constipation we may start uh, consider use of uh, peripherally acting uh, mu opiate receptor antagonist that is methyl naltrexone if there is no further improvement then third line will be that uh, we can do manual evacuation and uh, consider use of amora methyl naltrexone so brief about uh, laxative which should be used in uh, palliative care so there are uh, stimulant laxatives uh, bulk forming osmotic and stool softener so coming to st uh, stimulant laxative these are sena bisacodyl and sodium picosulfate these uh, got hydrolyzed by glycosidase in colon by colon bacteria into active compound and these act on the myentric plexus which stimulate peristalsis osmotic laxatives have a, uh, they retain water within the gut so uh, there are uh, lactulose polyethylene glycol which are also under uh, category of macrogons then magnesium and sulfate salts 
lactose once we take it get broken into organic acids and lower the ph which enhances motility and secretion in the colon but they after this organic acid there may be fermentation and they that will leads to increase uh, bloating so this patient also had bloating and abdominal uh, distension as a side effect then peg render water unabsorbable unabsorbable within the gut so there will be huge amount of water and it has to be taken with a uh, large quantity of water magnesium and sulfate salt they not uh, they don't get absorbed in the gut and maintain osmotic potency throughout the gut so this will uh, uh, drain i mean uh, the water will come in the gut from the external uh, extra cellular compartments but with magnesium and uh, like, um, sulfate salts there will be huge amount of uh, electrolyte disturbance so the osmotic laxative should be we should take care that patient should not have any any contraindication like if the patient is uh, not able to take huge uh, fluid or if the patient is having renal dysfunction then we won't be able to give fluids and there might be electrolyte disturbance so we should take care of all the patients then stool softener or lubricant like surfactant which is docusat is a active component in stool softener which increases water penetration of the stool and it also increases secretion of sodium chloride and water in the jejunum while liquid paraffin is commonly prescribed as a treatment so it softens and uh, lubricates stools but aspiration may cause lipid pneumonia especially in patients who are frail and having uh, issues with the uh, cognitive issues so it should not be used in those patients bulk forming laxatives like xylem and methyl cellulose they dissolve and swell in the intestine and increases fecal bulk and peristalsis through stretch so <clears throat> and they require huge amount of water which is not feasible in palliative care patients and uh, they are not recommended as such in uh, palliative care for as a, as a management of chronic constipation so in this uh, systematic review for treatment of opioid induced constipation uh, they found that uh, the incidence as i told is around 20 to 7, 80 90% and uh, they found that uh, peripherally acting new opioid receptors they are effective in opioid induced constipation procalopride and lubiprostone lubiprostone is a calcium channel uh, inhibitor in the small intestine leading to secretion of fluid and the same mechanism with the procalopride they are slightly better than the placebo but not as effective as amora in oic so so should we switch uh, morphine when if even if the patient is not getting relief with the uh, peripheral acting new opioid receptor so we should switch uh, or rotate uh, opioid from morphine or for hydromorphone to methadone and success rate of 40 to 80% has been reported and but uh, the european uh, palliative care research collaborative study had concluded that there is no evidence of opioid uh, rotation or switching so a brief about uh, peripherally acting new opioid receptor antagonist like elvimopin was the first or the initial uh, drug which has been used and it is oral uh, but it got discontinued due to increased cardiovascular side effects then oxycodone and naloxone combination which are extended release uh, combination has been used uh, they are oral and found to be licensed for oic uh, this uh, act on the peripheral receptors and because they don't uh, cross blood brain barrier so the patient will not have uh, analgesia withdrawal they will continue to get uh, pain relief but the effect on git will be there so <clears throat> then methyl naltrexone is one another agent but it is mainly for subcutaneous uh, administration we can't give it orally and uh, it has been uh, effective found to be effective in oic but uh, there are uh, certain issues that if the patient is having uh, Uh, obstruction or uh, narrowing of the gut then they may be uh, reports of perforation intestinal perforation and single dose can be used 
uh, to evaluate whether the patient will get a relief with the ethyl interaction or not to evaluate the contribution of opioid in constipation and other OIBD symptoms. Then naloxazole and naldimidine, naldimidine they are newer uh, peripherally acting new opioid receptor antagonist administered orally and uh, naloxazole is uh, approved for OIC while uh, naldimidine is not available even in European countries. So <clears throat> The most frequent switch, as I told, uh, the most constipating drug is morphine and hydromorphone, while uh, transdermal fentanyl is less constipating than morphine. Buprenorphine and L fentanyl are required in very less doses, so they are less constipating. Methadone is less constipating, action only partly mediated through opiate receptors. It has uh, effect through various receptors, so. Uh, it will be not as constipating. In fact, it has been uh, methadone has been the preferred drug to switch uh, morphine, hydromorphone, or fentanyl, especially in patients who are uh, having OIC. Tramadol and tetentadol, if the patient is having uh, not severe pain, maybe moderate pain, then they should be start, uh, given and they have found to have lower uh, rates of constipation. So, uh, if the patient is having uh, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, or delirium, or urinary retention and terminal restlessness, and the X-ray shows uh, this picture, means there may be uh, stool infection, fecal infection. Then we should think of fecal infection. So what should we do? There are a few interventions. Uh, first, first is to do digital rectal examination, and if there are hard feces in the rectum, then bisacodyl. 10 mg suppository plus glycerol uh, suppository and combination laxative. The commonly used uh, laxatives in uh, chronic constipation are stimulant and stool softener. So they should be used. If they are ineffective, then we can use enema. If the impacted feces are soft, then bisacodyl 10 mg suppository plus oral stimulant is enough. And this is effective in most of the time. If it is ineffective, then use enema. If the rectum is empty, but as uh, if the rectum is empty and in this picture is there, means the colon is full, then uh, use combination laxative plus phosphate enema. So a little bit about uh, those uh, enemas and resinal for use. And potential like uh, normal saline can be used which will distend the rectum and moisten stools and soften feces with less irritating effect on rectal mucosa but large volume uh, water enema causes uh, risk of water intoxication if enema is retained then soap solution can be used in which 1 ml of soap is uh, added in 200 ml of solution so 1 is to 200 ratio the total volume required usually is 1 liters it may, this soap may cause uh, chemical irritation of the mucous membranes. Then osmotic micron enema may be used. Then hypertonic sodium phosphate enema will distend and stimulate rectal motility. Docosate sodium may be used. Desacrodyl can be used, uh, which is a stimulant laxative. So it will uh, promote intestinal motility by means of passage of water into the intestinal lumen from vessels. But with stimulation, there may be abdominal discomfort like cramps and abdominal pain and diarrhea may happen. Retention enemas are uh, held within the large intestine for a specified period, usually at least 30 minutes. Palm oil retention enemas like cottonseed or olive oil may be uh, used, which lubricate and soften the stool. So it can be expelled more easily. Then peristine may be used. So we may also encounter patients uh, who had uh, intestinal obstruction, like they may be having uh, abdominal malignancy, which uh, causes interluminal or extraluminal compression. Then there may be uh, deposits in the intestine, which causes compression. Then previous uh, intestinal surgery, which causes adhesions and uh, causes obstruction. Then patient we patient will be having uh, alternating constipation and diarrhea and gut colic and nausea and vomiting. So we should think of uh, intestinal obstruction. Pain uh, radiograph will definitely help in uh, uh, 
uh, evaluating this side of picture there may be multiple glue uh, gut fluid levels air fluid levels in the abdominal x-ray and uh, the management of uh, malignant bowel obstruction will depend on the patient's general condition patient's functional status and life expectancy if a patient is having malignant bowel obstruction they usually survive for uh, six to eight weeks and uh, depending on the lesion if it is due to adhesion then maybe surgery may be repeated or even stenting if the patient's general condition is not good then stenting colonic stent may be uh, used as a modality but uh, in uh, malignant bowel obstruction what happens is there will be huge amount of uh, gut secretions so there will be distension and all so patient should be uh, uh, nasogastric tubes will be inserted and uh, that will help in uh, relieving the distension to a certain extent oral fluids may be in the sips of water should be allowed depending on the patient's uh, life expectancy we should not completely stop uh, oral fluids because that will uh, just uh, sips of water will definitely help uh, patients in uh, this condition and uh, analgesic should be continued if the patient is having severe pain maybe uh, fentanyl may be given as a IV infusion should be given. So, uh, coming to my uh, last slide. So, the take home message is constipation is a symptom, not a disease. So, we have to evaluate properly, see for the underlying cause. There must be uh, any malignancy or drug or any other comorbid illness which is causing constipation. So, we, if it is correctable, then we should take, uh, uh, we should treat that all those correctables. Opioid induced constipation is under recognized, under treated and distressing. So it is uh, there in almost 70 to 90 percent of the patients. So we should be uh, we should be aware that when we are giving opioid that this side effect is should be there. <clears throat> Even tolerance to constipation is not seen as such. Then prevention of constipation should be attempted through lifestyle changes but it is not feasible especially in palliative care patient but we should uh, advise patient and uh, inform regard when we prescribe opioids that this kind of thing like dietary modification fluid intake exercise mobility and uh, giving adequate time for uh, defecation they should be advised to the patient and in the initial visit where even when we prescribe opioids and we should co-prescribe laxative with opioids means that the hand that writes the opioid prescription should write the laxative prescription as well. Thank you. Thank you, Vinod. Thank you, ma'am. So before Arun starts asking, I want to ask you one question, yes, which uh, yesterday in IAPC course one very important, very important question asked by a by a uh, participant that uh, whether uh, laxative abuse is very common in palliative care settings and what should we, how should we handle the laxative abuse and then please Arun you, you can go ahead with the question answer okay so yes, yes ma'am uh, it's a clear, good question and commonly encountered problem especially in uh, uh, patients who are admitted for uh, constipation sometimes we over prescribe and uh, on every visit we should uh, ask and we even even we can uh, give them a diary to record their uh, uh, bowel movements like if the patient uh, so we should uh, in fact uh, some of the patients will not require even laxatives even with the opioid prescription on high dose we have found that uh, almost 20 to 30 percent patients will not be having constipation and giving uh, laxative in such patients may lead to laxative abuse and maybe diarrhea and those electrolyte disturbances depending on which laxative we are using. So we should properly evaluate and ask on every visit whether they are having uh, any issues in their gut motility uh, means uh, diarrhea or constipation that will definitely help us in uh, controlling this problem. Yes ma'am. So in this I want to add one thing that in, in India most of the time uh, in, the, in the middle age people start taking isab gold and uh, which is very commonly used in these in this country so it is very important that we have to ask 
this that whether uh, whether they are already taking this kind of uh, because these are bulk forming uh, agent and this will worsen the constipation if we are oh, prescribing opioids so this is what uh, i want to add in this now uh, it was a comprehensive presentation we know now go ahead arun to the question answer please uh thank you dr vinod uh, very nice presentation we have one question about uh, neurological diseases causing constipation for example any kind of uh, trauma to the spinal cord and it causes neurological loss of muscle function causing constipation can you uh, talk something about that uh neurological involvement especially uh, we encounter as a complication as a malignant spinal cord compression which we commonly seen in palliative care the patients will definitely have an issues with bowel movement so they will definitely have uh, issues in those patients uh, i mean we frequently encountered that uh, proper laxative use will definitely help in those patients and uh, they don't have constipation as such in our patients but uh, again the, the what happens uh, during these neurological insult is that uh, there will be uh, improper relaxation of uh, sphincter tone there will be poor anal sphincter tone and patient will not be having uh, that control so sometimes this patient will have uh, incontinence or they are not able to even if they have urge they are not able to pass the uh, stool so uh, training uh, that the physiotherapy and those uh, training with the Uh, in pmr department we usually have in some of the departments in pmr department they give training that uh, how to uh, go about this means uh, every they timed uh, the i mean like every they make it a, a routine that between like in the early morning time when if we see about the physiology the normal bowel movements usually happen in the morning when we wake up or when we take large meal these are the time when we have a bowel urge to defecate so if it is there then that can be potentiated in addition the physic uh, the training by the uh, mr uh, will definitely help in addition to laxatives use yes yes thank you so um, i think that what um, thank you for that i mean also i think you will agree with me that it also depends on the level of uh, uh, i mean neurological involvement right mm -hmm. uh, so if there is a neurological level involvement about about thoracic 7 vertebra or spinal level not vertebra spinal level then the voluntary control of abdominal muscles are mostly absent but the spinal reflexes are present if the uh, as you said if the uh, damage occurs at thoracic 7 then with voluntary control abdominal muscle we have sacral reflexes but if it is below uh, thoracic 7 spinal level then both uh, abdominal muscle uh, voluntary control and sacral reflexes are gone so sometimes there is upper motor neuron type sometimes there is lower motor neuron type and as you said it is very important uh, the pmr department probably will uh, assess the condition where the damage to the uh, spinal cord is and then they will uh, give a spinal bowel regimen depending whether it is an upper motor or lower motor or a mixed kind of uh, feature clinically so yeah. thank you for that uh, for the next uh, question comes is uh, uh, in your clinical practice dr vinod yes what is your experience with uh, ayurvedic medications like trifala and people do take so what is your experience with that uh, people sometimes take and they don't even inform whether they are taking or not Uh, i mean it has been found that they definitely has a role those uh, trifla and they uh, sometimes they are act as a stimulant so we we have found even uh, i mean i don't have a actual experience of how much i mean because i have never taken those uh, ayurvedic medication myself but what the patient says that uh, trifla or even uh, papaya and all those uh, dietary modifications they will definitely help in passage of stool and uh, they are effective to a certain extent we should take the history uh, whether they are uh, taking uh, drugs but sometimes patient also take uh, medication through online i mean without any uh, our knowledge that whether they are taking in addition to what we have prescribed sometimes that may leads to overuse of laxative 
so it will be difficult it become difficult to manage such patients so proper uh, history and uh, evaluation regarding intake of such uh, indigenous compound should be taken yes uh, any experience with uh, usage of uh, sena in your clinical practice uh, dr vinod no 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 okay so i'll just read uh, a comment from uh, dr rajeshri so she says that for constipation in uh, neurological illnesses particularly in community setup uh, they are using uh, suppository on alternate days and uh, it gives more control on bowel emptying thank you for sharing dr rajeshri uh, she also shared that bulk laxatives and trifala are used by general population it is the patient to decide whether the particular measure is uh, giving them comfort i mean it's always like that uh then lalit raigar is uh, adding more to it like methi ajwain and warm water uh, can also be given for uh, as like the patient okay yes uh, these are harmless sub, uh, harmless uh, dietary intake which can be continued as a dietary modification <laughs> to such patients will definitely help because all the laxative will have some side effect and they don't have much so they can be advised as a no Yes, sir. Yeah. So, Arun, Doctor Rajeshri has good comments. Three, four good comments. So, can we uh, request her to unmute herself and speak? Uh, Sushma, you want me to speak? Yes. Uh, the two of us are in. It is a uh, little uh, different, like uh, non-malignant neurological diseases in uh, in community setting. we have found that you not know, because of the uh, multiple problems like the, like the patient will be physically immobile and and on the top of that they will be having you know like neurological dysfunction uh, which results in abnormal uh, bowel movement pattern so many laxatives the action could be unpredictable uh, because uh, they will not be having control as well because they don't know whether they are emptying their bowel or not so it it causes a lot of you know the problem with their dignity and the dependence so uh, that is why we uh, we started using uh, suppositories uh, particularly bisacral suppositories so if you insert the suppository so that way uh, roughly uh, mean, uh, not in all all patients but usually it uh, results in proper bowel movement within one or two hours so if you if you use it on alternate days that gives them a pretty kind of good control on their own bowel movement so that they can they can predict they can so uh, somewhat they can predict approximately within what time they will have that bowel movement so that gives them a kind of control and that sense that uh, you know kind of dignity uh, because uh, uh, being paralyzed and being on bed you know it it is it, it causes lot of problems than physical so that is one experience and using trimela and all uh, bulk laxatives we generally discourage because unless we ensure proper intake of water so bulk laxatives can worsen constipation that is what i hear and i read and that is what i have seen in my practice and with respect to trimela i don't know the exact mechanism of action i have seen people using i mean both in general population as well as in the palliative care population but still we say that the mechanism Uh, of uh, opioids constip causing constipation could be different so you might have to use additional laxatives so as to ensure proper bowel movement so i have seen people using both trimela and uh, you know like uh, uh, the the softness like liquid paraffin so that they will enjoy a comfortable bowel movement and the second thing is that i have seen uh, um, quite a number of patients using urinary medicines i don't know the preparation something like uh, uh, some some Uh, i don't I, i just i am not able to recall the brand name as well and they have found you know uh, uh, this uncomfortable bubble cramps while using uh, bisacral and uh, they have experienced i mean they they, they, they could not find uh, liquid paraffin palatable as well as uh, you know like lactose as well so they resorted to uh, using urinary medicines for them urinary medicine which they used to regulate the dose they used to regulate with the daily medicine they used to get comfortable bowel movement with oic so uh, i don't know what the preparation uh, the contains and how does it work that i am not sure so it is finally i think uh, sushma it is the patient's comfort 
whether the patient and we know that uh, rightly on without yoga we have to take a, a proper bubble history which many times we, we, we overlook so what is comfortable for the patient uh, that we should adopt if the patient has been having bubble movement on alternate days even prior to starting our course and if he is experiencing the same kind of bubble movement after starting ஒரு <laughs> 